Take a Walk Down Prairie Street with Elliot Moskowitz. Founder and CEO of PrairieStreet.co, Elliot Moskowitz interviews the most interesting personalities in the Jewish and secular world. Today's guest, veteran cooking instructor and author of the Giving Table Cookbook, Naomi Ross. Welcome to A Walk Down Prairie Street. My name is Elliot Moskowitz. I'm the founder and CEO of Prairie Street. We're on location for the first time ever we've done this. Uh, it's not our own set. We're in the home of Naomi Ross. Welcome. In Woodmere, New York. And this is a guest setup. We've never really done this like this before, but we've been filming shorts here all day. And I thought, you know, part of the reason I started this podcast was to... You know, sometimes you'll have some banter when you're filming a video and you get to learn like a nugget of information, but there's really more to it and why people came to this is their passion and what they do. And that's why I said we should just set some time aside and and do that. So first of all, you just have an amazing kitchen. (laughs) It's an amazing kitchen, I think. The second I saw this kitchen on like a Zoom call, I already had a film shoot in mind, you know, at at this point. Well, the kitchen actually sold me the house, believe it or not, because I always, like when when we were moving, we were looking to move to a different home, and I was teaching a lot, and I, I had been teaching cooking classes for a lot of years, and one of the things that was important to me was that I had a really good working space, either for classes or for lessons or for catering that I knew like was a good like setup and it's more than a good setup yeah. and, and the fact that you have so much room a room around this really extended island uh, makes it something that you can entertain people are watching with you they're cooking with you they're yeah. hanging with so you it's a good flow it's a good working yeah. kitchen and also when you're putting your kids to work so like they have a space <laughs> right it becomes like a conveyor belt everybody <laughs> has a space everybody knows what they're doing so that's amazing that's a blessing and when i think about chefs uh, there's different categories there's kind of some people that are just amazing behind the scenes running a restaurant and or whatever they're doing, and they sewer fantastic food. Um, And they're great at figuring out the logistics, no matter how many people or whatever they're dealing with, and figuring out what their menu is. And then there's the educators, the ones that are teaching. Now, some wear both hats. You know, they're involved in food preparation in some way, and they're also teaching. But I come from an education family. My father was a public school principal. My mother was a teacher. And I think that's a gift in itself because sometimes when you look at like complicated information, people have a sense to teach it complicated to show how smart they are, right? And they want to say, okay, here's this and you got to do it this way and that. But when you could take something that is complicated and really simplify it and get it to a level that people are comfortable with them, then it gives them more confidence to do even more things. I think there's a knack for, I think it's a knack to be able to take complicated ideas or complicated, whether it's a recipe or an idea or a concept, and to be able to say it over or present it in a way that's simplified and makes it approachable. I think that's, I think that's actually a, a special knack. And I, I know like different teachers, rabbis, different people in different fields that when you get somebody who has that knack and they make something that's so complicated all of a sudden so like simple, I think that's special. So, Right, and I think what also happens is, um, you know, when I started this project to build this channel like three years ago, I started obsessing watching things, but I'm also a big reader. I have a, like 200 cookbooks and... Um, you're one of my favorites on the kosher <laughs> side, actually, the giving table. And this is something that everybody really should look at and the story behind that. And you see the passion that I'm talking about. But I was introduced to you last year through a mutual friend, Chef David Kalotkin, yeah. former executive chef at Prime Grill in Manhattan. Yeah. And you worked with him very closely. So tell us about that. Alone. So... Over the course of a lot of years of teaching, um, and I was always what I called the champion of the home cook. Like I always was primarily teaching recreational 
classes teaching primarily home cooks how to cook better. And at a certain point, I really wanted to further my own education and to bring back to the home cook the things that all restaurant chefs know. You know, professional kitchens work very differently than home kitchens, but what I really wanted to be able to do was to better school the home cook based on the knowledge that professional kitchens have. And so I sort of made it my business to get my foot in the door and do what they call trailing, which is sort of like apprenticing or interning, but you're working for free and you're just working for experience. And exactly. I, I was really fortunate to have several experiences like that. It changed the way I taught, it changed the way I cooked, it changed the way I ran my kitchen. And one of the people that I had that experience with, on the, I did it both in kosher and non-kosher kitchens. Of course, I couldn't eat anything uh, in, in non-kosher kitchens, but I learned a tremendous amount. And one of the kosher kitchens that I did it in was with Chef David. He was very, very kind and let me come to not just the main prime restaurant, but some of the other, at the time there were a few different prime restaurants and right. I went with him to, you know, different places and, you know, thank God I was very fortunate. He was very generous with his um, tutelage, so to speak. You All know, right. he, he really right. gave over a lot of information and uh, let, let me learn there. But, um, but it's also been nice to have him as a colleague and a friend. We just did a class together at Degustibus, which was so much fun. Right, so actually we were involved in that the event at the Gustavo yep. School, a prestigious school in uh, Macy's on uh, Herald Square. And we provided... And your, your meat was the, uh, <laughs> was the definite like star of the show. I would disagree with that. I would say there's two stars. There's <laughs> one of the main actors is the meat. It's as good as the product you start with. And then you have talent as you and David. And as someone that does lo a lot of long form videos and stuff, it was just amazing to watch the interaction. In my mind, I'm already seeing like filming you like for our channel because that's the way I think at this point I'm wired. And I think when you work with someone else on, uh, on a set or on camera or teaching a class, it can either be awkward or dynamic. And if it's awkward, like who's doing more and I'm just watching you and you're doing your thing. Well, you know, it's not always a natural vibe. I was thrilled that we were, we were able to do that with each other because Chef David said to me, I'm used to working solo. I'm not used to having somebody up here, but like it was really fun. We didn't step on each other's feet and we sort of strategized a little bit. You know, I'm going to take this, you're going to take this. No, I think it was perfect yeah. and it was kind of like a teacher student thing but the students grown up and is the teacher now too so yeah. that was great and that we got really excited at prairie street do you know so when you build a startup and you get involved with media and there's influencers and there's a lot of things moving underneath social media but one thing i was really committed to from the beginning and i've we've spent like some serious capital and resources to do that is to educate and to teach in a really high quality way in any way that you're comfortable, whether it be in an oven or sous vide or cooking outside in a smoke or a grill and a sado, a wood fired oven, whatever it is, we play with that. And so when you look at influencers or I look at that influence uh, world, I look at it like, who's really authentic of what they do. So, you know, if someone is doing it because they're being paid to do that, they're sending a, let's say you used to call it a tweet or an X from an, an Android phone, but you're working for Apple, that doesn't come out so great. So I think when you hear that, I mean, I started reading and I was telling <laughs> you, I was told you several times, I have like three versions of this book that I read introductions. and. I think when someone has a story to tell of what got them into that. We have a story, why did I start this company? Most of my career worked on Wall Street. But I think your story is interesting and why don't you tell us a little about what got you into this? So, I mean, I really started this as, it, it, I never intended it to be a career. I never had professional aspirations. I was myself somewhat newly married, maybe I was married like three or four years, and I always had a passion for cooking. Um, and I really started teaching classes as a community service. It was not something I had like this whole plan I hatched in the beginning, I didn't even charge money. I, I really just did it to help people in the community. 
specifically new brides, you know, sort of like a homemaking, you know, crash course, um, combining cooking and baking basics with some homemaking and Jewish inspirational ideas. And it took a life of its own. It sort of took its own grassroots um, direction. And over the years, you know, it just one thing took me to the next thing to the next thing. And the trailing, the, you know, the work that I did at, at restaurants was really to keep me up to speed, to be able to keep up with the growth of what I was doing, teaching different classes. A teacher can't teach if they don't know it themselves. Exactly. Right? So um, that really, you know, helped me get a better foundation in which I could be able to help the other home cooks that I was either teaching for or writing for because I was already also doing like food writing and writing for some magazines. I was starting to do my own recipe development. And so all of it sort of came together. The, the book itself is really a culmination of all the years of doing these different things together. So a lot of like the international recipes in my book, they're really an outgrowth of the international classes I taught for my JCC series. I did for probably over the course of 10 years, I was teaching JCC classes and the international classes were the most popular. So all of those recipes ended up getting developed and worked on. Especially, and yeah. you're doing it in a kosher way. Yeah. So we've made like Greek moussaka with coconut milk instead of doing dairy. So even though we're not pushing kosher on the channel, but all our recipes yeah, are and, kosher. And some just, of those cuisines lend very well, and some of them can be very challenging to know how, how and what should be substituted, or if it can be substituted, which things to play with, which things not to play with. You know. So one of our goals has been, and I think we're on the same page on that, is moving from old school when people had two or three cookbooks and you know they would just follow a recipe to the T and first of all there's a lot more technology and methods to use but yeah. setting that even aside is we're teaching concepts right and sometimes instead of saying hey I'm just going to do that what do you have to work with and you have some issues and how can you even mix and match Method. So it tends to be, our experience has been that people like to stay in two, maybe three comfort zones. They're doing, you know, the oven and the stovetop, or they're a barbecue guy but uh, doesn't want to do the smoker, whatever that yeah. mix is. So we try to push everybody uh, push to, to be comfortable. Push the limits a little bit. No, push the <laughs> limits, but whatever zone you want to do it, we'll show you how to do that. And we'll do it with great chefs like you, God willing, are going to be filming with us some of the long form videos soon. And we have, we teach those concepts and I'll just give you a quick example of that. So in my outdoor kitchen in Hollywood that we film, I have a smoker, a grill, an asado, a Weber, a pizza oven. It's pretty crazy out there, but I was making for a bunch of people like a 14 pound boneless ribeye roast, wow. okay? And I was smoking it. I should come to your house for dinner. Uh, yeah, people were pretty happy. And um, I was just smoking it. And I had this puzzle because, you know, I know the good chefs can use the palm of their hand and all that. That's nothing. You can't teach people to, be able to use the palm of your hand. You do that for 10 years, you could use the palm of your hand. <laughs> A meat thermometer is your best friend. Yeah. What's going on inside this one? So it was puzzling to me that the outside three or four pounds and this part of the three or four pounds, we're at like about 118, 120. I was just ready to pull the moss in. But the middle was at 105, and I couldn't figure that out. So I called one of my chefs, Michael Blom, who has been on our channel, great. And he explained to me the science of what was going on. So I go, well, like, what am I going to do? If I jack it up, then the outsides are going to get overcooked. Yeah. And in the middle of that, but if not, it's going to be too rare even for people that like it like that. So what I do, I took this Anova Precision Oven, which is like sous vide, but you don't have to bother to put it in a cryovac and a tub. Yeah. There's a water chamber, you put it right in there. And I just dialed in like 126, put the whole thing in right the way it was, an hour and a half, and I had even to even. So I took sous vide experience and figure out how can I do that without putting a cap on the outside things. And I think those are concepts yeah. that you teach, you have a pro tip. We have something that we also show is like, when someone says something amazing, it's a pro tip and you should, and you simplify. So the point isn't too complicated. And you, you learn this skill, and you say, hey, I could apply it to something else. And that's when I think 
someone's really been taught because if they could be free form a little like 80 20 at least i think i think it's i think it's also and i once you have the foundation then you can start hacking what you know what you know meaning you can take shortcuts only when you know the right way to do it if it'll work i hack my own recipes all the time right i actually just did this the other day i have a recipe in the book and it's a sauteed recipe and i hacked i was in a, in a hurry and i was like well I know if I do it in this other way, it should technically work, and it did. But in the book, I have lots of shortcuts. For my own recipes, I'll take a shortcut sometimes because I want the readers to know the right way to do it and the, the tried and true way. And then once you know that, then you can always take a shortcut. Absolutely, and that's kind of why we've never really done this before. Usually we film our long form videos over a few days. But there's also everybody's attention span, time, everybody's busy. They want to get to the essence of what you want. So we did something that we've never done and just filmed for a bunch of shorts with you. And then people can have an option of watching a short version and a long version of that and mix it. Because the more when they're patient, it's not just trying to get it done, but they want to learn concepts. That's what they'll get then more with the others. And we, you know, we're excited to have you on camera with us. I'm excited to be here. I feel like this has been a very fun, it's been a long day, but it's been a very, very fun day. And I think we got a lot of really great content. These shorts are going to be a lot condensed into a small amount and you're going to get your bang for your buck, so to speak. Yeah, and I think it's very important that we get feedback from people, what they like, what they like to see more of. I think you're going to see Naomi and Prairie Street <laughs> and other uh, things. We did something at Kosher Palooza together, a demo together, or I watched you did a demo <laughs> and then tried to eat the meat with a spoon or something. I'm not <laughs> sure exactly what happened, but that was a very cool dish. And, uh, you know, like I started with that, the people that are sincerely passionate about this, this, you know, to put a project like this together is a huge undertaking. And everybody says, oh, everything's digital and quick, but you know there's a different level of comprehension i read a lot um, but when you see especially when you see the images and you think about it and you take the time but even more so take the time to know the person that's writing the book <laughs> i mean because if you don't have context like when i meet new people or something like that it's like i'm more interested who they are at first because you have no context of who you're talking to so well you know i feel like what i tried really hard to do was to talk to my readers through the writing that's in the book. Even though it's a cookbook, many people have told me that it's a good read. And what I tried very hard to do was to talk to the readers and give them not just the tips and all the shortcuts and all that stuff, but a little bit of a boost of what also home cooks need to hear because home cooks are suffering, so to speak. Um, in what sense? You know, some people are suffering because they wish they could do more home cooking, but they don't have the time. Some home cooks are suffering because they don't have the esteem for what they're doing anymore, and they feel like it's a thankless job. And I feel like if we could put a little bit more confidence and self-esteem back into the cooking that they do, then they'll feel better about what they're doing. They'll feel better about the food that they're making. And that trickles down into what you put on the table. So, Absolutely. you know, that's one of my goals is to try to sort of bring the love and esteem back to home cooking because what you serve around the table is of the most important cooking that you're going to be doing. And that's what we do at Prairie Street and is our main goal is to get that super high quality meat to this home combined with those home cooking. Yeah. And, you know, and I go to a fair amount of restaurants as you do, and some are really extravagant and good, but at the end of the day, you know, before I came here and stuff, I haven't eaten in two days and I had a little <laughs> tasting menu of everything that he did today. There's nothing better than that. And it's also like a family experience. Like, you know, how many times at dinner everybody's looking at their phone or other things that's happening and when you're in a kitchen like this or with your family in whatever kitchen you have and you're preparing and you kind of set your time aside that this is an important thing, it gives perspective. And at the end of the day, those are really going to be the best meals you'll ever have. Man. Yeah, and almost every demo I do, I try to give over the message that your food is a vehicle. Your food is a facilitator. It should look good, it should taste good, because why? 
because by itself it should be a gourmet thing. Yeah, okay, it's good, and I believe in the art form, and I believe in the craft of cooking, but ultimately, your food is a vehicle and a facilitator for what you can accomplish with that dish. And when you make it so delicious and inviting and it's drawing people around the table, that's when you can get people to the table and have the conversations you want to have and get them to put away their phones and restore a little bit of the family time. I try to you know, remind people, including myself, right, that that table time is like a sanctuary. You know, it's a little bit of like the last vestige we have to maintain you know, a sense of family and a sense of, um, of what home life can be. And Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, running a startup, work 80, 90 hours a week, whatever, I'm flying all the time, things are happening. And I've really never, as much as I absorb technology and use it in every way that I can in what we do, I kind of appreciate the fact when Shabbat comes that you know that thing is off, mm -hmm. and and actually, I'm the bigger re biggest <laughs> reader of cookbooks on Shabbat. Whatever I have that reading window before I take my little yeah. nap, um, and and that's what's been fun is making these videos and working with chefs and being creative and changing things on the fly. Um, is the main point isn't to show, and you're a very modest and humble person, and I think that makes sense for being a great educator because if the point of this is to show how smart you are then you, then you haven't really people can't relate to that and and I think as you were saying before that you can get people to push a little out of their zone once they get confident and it works which is why literally the first thing I did was give a meat thermometer with every order. Like, that could be, the meat could be like insane, yeah. right? And we told you exactly what to do, but you have no idea. Every oven you is could, different, it's you calibrated. Could, you, could, you could kill a beautiful piece of meat very easily. Yeah, especially in ribs, like 10 yeah. degrees is here, or in shoe leather, whatever. Yeah. And so, you know, giving, you have all this technology, all these tools that make that really easy. So like my mom, uh, Olive was 92 when she had 91 when there was COVID and she was stuck in her apartment and I sent her an Instapot and I videoed and I gave her a lesson and she was, let's say, traditional in her cooking. I, there was a consistency over time and I said, Mom, this is like the greatest thing. You just do that instead of spending five hours on a chicken soup, boom, 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 boom. And she was like banging out new soups in like a week <laughs> and stuff like that. And I think that's what that is. It's like if you're doing it in private and just with your family and you're experimenting, then you get that confidence that when you're serving your family or having friends over, that that becomes part of your toolkit. You know what? Like as an educator, I think that the reason that, I think that what you said before I mean, I appreciate the compliment, but really what it is is that when you, when you know what you don't know, right, then you can learn new things, right? So when you, when you see what a big world out there there is of all the information and all the different techniques and all the different things you want to give over, so I find that to be very humbling. I'm constantly learning new things that I didn't know, and I'm happy about that because then, you know, I can, I can take in new new in order to give right to, to students and I learned from my students also I coined a term many many years ago when I first started teaching and that is that um, the, the term is turn the page which is the experience that home cooks have when they get intimidated and they get scared of a new recipe or a new technique and they're looking through a cookbook and they're like unfamiliar lingo unfamiliar ingredient uh, turn the page you know and that that experience deters and prevents people from growing and learning new things. Whenever I teach you know, anything, I'm always trying to demystify terminology or ingredients or tell you what it is or where it's from or so that you don't turn the page on it, right? So that, so that home cooks can then feel the confidence, okay, it's not as scary as I thought. I, 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 can, I can maybe do that, you know, and it makes it approachable. It makes it something that we can, we can try. And I'm even myself guilty of it. Sometimes I'll get a new cookbook and I'll look at something and I'll be like, mm, foreign, and I, and I feel myself turning the page. <laughs> it happens to everyone. Yeah, you know? well, everybody, it's, 
it's not meant to be who's best. Every year, is a, it's a culture, it's a style. We also feature videos are from Italy and Lebanon and Israel and Mexico. And you just um, mix that and you take it and then it becomes kind of fun. And on a personal basis, I could absolutely appreciate because yeah. that's something that I tell people all the time is, I know what I know what I know and I and know what I don't know, but I try to learn as much and I just have a, a thirst forever to learn. And when you're at a certain level of understanding the processes, then each iteration is much more sophisticated than when you're just trying to understand the project from the beginning. And that's what we've done in production and cooking and building the company, people working with you, getting feedback from people like David of what's considered excellence, which is the category that we're in. And, you know, that's why I think Prairie Street, Elliot personally, Naomi, I think are a great fit. Um, I was very, I never let go after seeing you <laughs> at the Ghost of Us, and um, I think my team could uh, corroborate that. That's pretty rare that I'm doing that, but I think you're fantastic. And so, what would be like the next step for you? you write another book, or um, Netflix, or <laughs> <laughs> no? I would love to write another book if the opportunity presented itself. But you know, we'll see. Yeah, I would, would, did yeah. you get certain feedback? Did you feel like there were certain subjects or angles that you wanted to cover that would have just been too overwhelming? So, you know, the book is very thematic as much as the chapters are very conventional, you know, soups or right. poultry or whatever it is. Um, but the, the book itself has a message and is thematic in terms of it being about the giving that we do through our kitchen, which is why it's called The Giving Table. And so, you know, I sometimes wonder if I would continue with that with that theme in the future, or if I would maybe find a different aspect or a different theme to, you know, to focus on. I don't know. It's similar to like a rock band or something. They come out with something no one's ever heard of, and they kind of get the right mix of people. Or is it going to be like a feature film sequel? Or we're going to see Fast and Furious number 39, yeah. or um, yeah, I don't or know. is it? But that's kind of the nice thing about being a creative is. Uh, expression my team knows that I use is etched in jello and sometimes you're just making little iterations yeah. and sometimes you just blow the whole thing in a different way. I, yeah. mean, I had other ideas before I wrote this book of things that I wanted to write about and you know the cookbook industry is tough. It is tough. And you have to have a saleable idea that really speaks to a wide enough audience you know I had a whole different idea that I was like really like passionate about and at a certain point I'm saying that preceded this idea and at a certain point I took a step back and I was like this isn't gonna sell you know like it's not gonna work and I actually was on an airplane when when I I was like you know that quasi weird place in between sleep and awake You're right so I was on an international flight and I was in that quasi sleepy place and this idea came to me, uh, how, and the thing sort of gelled in my head, and that's that's how it went. And then when I woke up, I started jotting down. So maybe I'll maybe I'll have another airplane ride. <laughs> so when I moved back from Brussels, and I was just my friend was uh, Michael was teaching me about smoking, and I wanted to get into that, and I was just so dying for good meat. That's kind of the reason I started this company, and. Uh, so I, I said, that was just great. I'm going to learn this smoking. And I said, you know, there's all these great cookbooks of religious women and Susie Fishbein and everybody, and Naomi, they're all, and everybody's fantastic at what they're writing, but who's writing like a guy's cookbook, like make, let's smoke something for Shabbos or something. And I said, I really think I could do that. I could write that book, even though most of my career worked on Wall Street. I don't know anything about writing books. So, um... He said to me, Elliot, I love you, but you're an old man. <laughs> and he says, learn how to do it on YouTube. And I've been obsessed since he's told me that. And I think instead of saying, because it's more like a bigger market, do people really read in longevity anymore and have that attention span? And there's a lot of things that are distracting and competing for that attention. So instead of saying, we're going to make people do that necessarily, there will be a crowd that's interested. I think video, and we've invested heavily in that, yeah. is, is a medium of teaching and actually in many ways more relatable. 
right? It's something that I remember my it's mother watching accessible. Julia Child yes. or something back in the day. It's right? very accessible and for many people, myself included, like I'm a visual learner. So I have to see it being done. If I see it being done, then I can do it. But, you know, back in the day when I was teaching myself so much, it was before cookbooks were as pictorial as they are now. So it required a far more amount of imagination to really know what you were creating without the pictures, without step-by-steps, without videos. And so I tried really hard at, when creating this book, I tried very hard to keep things visual. Yeah. I tried hard to you know, make sure there were step-by-steps or I have QR codes to how-to videos so people can actually see quickly how to do it. Um, and I think it's a different world in that way. Even the way, just speaking as a food writer, food writing itself even has changed that, you know, I remember I have a box in my basement of like Bon Appetit magazines from, yeah, of course. you know, 20 year, 15, 20 years ago. And the food articles were hugely long. Right. And now, you know, magazines don't print like that anymore. They're not doing, you know, six page articles on, you know, a, a trip to uh, Provence or whatever, wherever they went. Now... The food writing is bullet points. There's, you know, there's charts. Because there's who's reading bite a, size. Yeah. A, who's reading a three thousand word article and necessarily? I yeah. mean, I still read the Economist for the last thirty years. In a way, it's the best way to have a great Shabbos nap. But it's intense. Yeah. When and and you have to have a passion for that, and you can't just fight the overall market. You have to be able to do that. And I think these instruments yeah. can actually be done in a more effective. And that's why we have this balance of short and long yeah. forms that people can get deeper as they get confident and you know i knew we synced right from the beginning about this you know thirst and always trying to improve upon that and not losing sight of what's the real goal here is helping people getting them confident and it's really cool to watch when and actually we should probably follow up at some point like an ask an expert or do a q and a type of thing that people can you know talk about some of the videos that they've made and we could get some of their questions and discuss sure. that and kind of you know obviously we can't communicate with everybody individually but we could you know discuss that and we run yeah i think we have a di very diverse portfolio of chefs that are on our channel many of them aren't jewish but are experts in jewish cooking and yeah. globally oriented and uh, i'm super excited that you've accepted to join our family here and are just starting this or continuing this journey with us and i'm confident that every step is going to be a better step and we're going to learn from each other even it, in the it, i've already started learning a lot from from prairie because you have such wonderful meat to work with so you know certain things that that maybe didn't work with you know, lower quality cuts or lower quality meat, I see like the difference when working with your product and I feel like it's, it's a really cool experience. Well, consistent quality is the yeah. hardest two words of this entire project. <laughs> uh, you know, I was looking at a ranch in Texas and stuff yeah. like that. So, you know, there's a lot of moving parts, there's inflation, there's climate change, yeah. there's a lot of things that are happening. And, and they're animals. And they're animals. And so, <laughs> You know, we focus uh, primarily on excellence versus volume, and at least within the kosher world, we could, you know, we'd rather have the clients that really understand that quality but want it and don't have to worry, is, am I going to get a good shipment this time or yeah. what that quality is going to be. So I think you take that and you take the education. So we've been playing with a magazine the last few months, and we started Prairie Street Culinary Kitchen magazine. But this month's edition, the holiday issue that's coming out next week, is featuring you in a significant way. And I'm proud to say from a technology standpoint, it's an internet base, so you'll see floating links, embedded videos. So cool. I mean, it's like we, we put a lot of energy into our content machine, but there's no outside advertisers or anything, and it's hear about education, but it is a interactive education. So you could be reading, you could see a recipe, you could click a QR code to buy so the cool. meat, you could watch the video without going away to another place. So um, we'll be, you'll be hearing from us on 
blasting it. I'm sure your fan <laughs> club's going to be super happy with that. And it's, it's really cool. oh, yeah, all they have to do is sign up for an email and we're good to go. So thank you for being a gracious host. I've never walked thanks into for, a set and been coming, fed. Thanks for coming to my house. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm sure we're going to do this again. And hopefully you're, uh, you'll come to our other house in Hollywood and... Uh, we'll be filming and together. And you'll, you'll feed me also? Uh, I think we do. So actually, you know, I've made stuff for the crew and are we at, are we swapping out recipes all the time. <laughs> That's kind of the nice thing when we actually break at the end of the day and, um, and have that. And I think, you know, you get, to, for me, it's all about uh, getting like just today I was actually really hungry, but <laughs> in general, but it's about getting like a couple tastes and seeing what did they create. It makes, and, it makes me happy to feed people. So, you know, if you gave me an opportunity, you know, to me, people. people say this and health things. I mean, I've lost a lot of weight the last few years. I'm kind of on keto. And if you have good protein and vegetables and fruits and you stay away from sugar and carbs, you're pretty much good to go, you know, yeah. and, um, that's it. So thank you again for taking a walk down Prairie Street <laughs> and your kitchen of Naomi Ross. This was amazing and hope to see you in our other set very Looking soon and wishing you. you a great holiday or a good Chagim and for you and your family and for all our audience. Uh, they should have a happy and healthy new year. We should have a little peace in our life. And Amen. remember we're all on the same team at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Take Thanks. care. Thank you. Subscribe to our channel now and set your notifications so you don't miss our latest recipes and chef-led tutorials. Then head over to prairiestreet.co to shop for your next big meal.